I'm very pleased to see to see such a huge crowd on uh, this very special day um, in this lecture hall. And this day is special because we have an extraordinary, um, a very special visitor, uh, Dr. Alexei Ekaikin, who's with the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute in St. Petersburg um, in Russia. Let me introduce the speaker um, shortly. So <coughs> he finished uh, BS studies in 96 at St. Uh, Petersburg um, State University, and he studied geography and geoecology. Um, and then he did his uh, PhD thesis in 2003. Uh, it was a combined study at uh, St. Petersburg Un University and uh, the, um, University Joseph Fourier in Grenoble in France. And then he was a um, postdoctoral fellow supported by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science from 2006 until 2008. Um, he was stationed in Hokkaido in Japan. And since 2008, he's uh, again with the Arctic Research, uh, no, Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute. Um, he has lectured uh, at the um, St. Petersburg State University. And um, the most important part of his work is that he has been to the um, to Antarctica many times. He has been, he's participated in eight expeditions to Antarctica and he spent a total of um, 18 or 20 months in Antarctica. And uh, now he's here to tell us something about his stay in Antarctica. And I should mention that his stay in Ljubljana, his visit to Ljubljana is a part of the bilateral collaboration between um, Russia and Slovenia. So. <coughs> uh. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming in such a huge number. And thank you for inviting me, actually, uh, to give this talk here. It's a great uh, honor for me. So if I'm a little bit nervous, then you may understand me, OK? And uh, yeah, and personally, thank Paulona for inviting me. And yeah, it's, uh, it was her who organized this bilateral cooperation between Slovenia and Russia. Well, let's uh, move on uh, with our talk. So this, this uh, a bit strange title means that I'm going to tell you something about Antarctica, about deep drilling of ice and about uh, subglacial lakes. And uh, well, you know, sometimes when you are uh, giving a talk, you think about a phrase, epigraph, which describe uh, the best, the idea of, your, of what you are going to say. So you know maybe this. Uh, Surely you know this uh, phrase, fortune favors the brave, it's an uh, old Latin expression, but that's not about us. We have uh, our, <laughs> <laughs> our Russian version of this expression. I'm joking, of course, but uh, you know that the uh, role of good luck is uh, very, it's very big in, in uh, all this story, and uh, I will give you several examples of this. We cannot neglect this, this factor in our life, you know. Uh, <coughs> You maybe you could see this uh, picture somewhere in use, so you know that's the beginning of February 2012. The deep driller penetrated to subglacial Lake of Vostok, and I, I, I know it was a big uh, uh, discussion about this in, uh, in, in mass media. I was still in Antarctica there, so I did not, I could not participate, and I could not see this news. But, uh, well, this is what I'm uh, going to tell you about, the prehistory of this, of this event and uh, why we are drilling at Vostok Station and why we are exploring uh, this uh, Lake Vostok and so on. And, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to start with this. This is a map of Antarctica and uh, uh, Russia has now five uh, uh, wintering stations, uh, permanent stations in Antarctica. The first one is Mirny. Uh, Progress and Novolazarevska and Berenzgausen and there were two more in Soviet times here it was uh, Ruska station here Leningradska so you s simply can see the idea so we wanted to uh, make the stations all around the perimeter of Antarctic continents just to uh, have a kind of control maybe it's not a secret for you that uh, the studies uh, in, in Antarctic is mainly not about science it's about politics you People just want to, to, be, to be there, to keep the territory somehow. And then Vostok Station, right here. 
close to the center of the continent. So why Vostok is located where it is located? And now the fortune again played, uh, played its role. You know that in 1950, 50s, uh, uh, Antarctic continent was mainly unexplored yet. And people decided, well, we have to do something with that. And uh, they organized uh, International Geophysical Year, I IGY. One of the main goals was to uh, study, to study uh, Antarctica. And people gathered somewhere. It, it, it was in New York, I think, and uh, decided where, to, where each country will open their stations. And of course, uh, Soviet Union wanted to open the station and the South Pole, you know, because we already kept uh, more or less the whole Arctic. We, we had uh, uh, the, these drifting uh, stations at the North Pole. And then we wanted to also to, to hold the uh, southern, you know, uh, tip of, of the planet. But the Russian delegate, he came uh, too late for this meeting. He just was late, you know. <laughs> it happens with us uh, quite often. <laughs> And uh, the South Pole was al already taken by Americans. So they have uh, Amundsen Scott station over there. And this uh, poor Soviet guy, he called his bosses uh, in Kremlin and asked, what should I do then? OK, let's take uh, South Geomagnetic Pole then. Uh, they, they answered him. And this is more or less uh, where Vostok station is. And then it was organized a traverse, you know, logistic trans tra transport caravan from Mirny to this inland of Antarctica. It started in uh, 1956 and, well, it took two years for them to go, to go there because they were more or less the first who traveled the, in the interior of Antarctica in, in such a harsh conditions and they used a technique like this, you know. Some of these machines are still alive, by the way, you may not believe me, but once I participated in a traverse using maybe exactly this one machine, I don't know. Still alive somehow. And uh, well, so they were moving and moving, and finally they, they said, OK, we can't move anymore. Let's stop <laughs> just, just here. It will be our Vostok station. And uh, actually, if they uh, moved just five kilometers more, they would, uh, yeah, they would uh, have gone offshore the Lake Vostok. But they stopped just at the right place. Five kilometers more, and there is no lake un under the station. So it's uh, just good luck, and people didn't know about the lakes at all at that time. Just no idea about the sublacial lakes in, in Antarctica. Well, what is Vostok Station? A short description of it. So it's uh, altitude 3,500 meters, and that, that's why it's so cold and so low pressure, very di difficult conditions for working and so on. Uh, still the coldest place on Earth, Vostok still keeps the record, though it's not the highest station in Antarctica, by the way. And uh, precipitation uh, rate is very low, like in Sahara Desert, more or less, and, well, there are many works which are performed there. Uh, a lot of scientific activity, like meteorology, of course, magnetosphere, ground glaciological observations, deep, deep ice scoring, and uh, uh, Lake Vostok studies. Uh, 1970, a uh, very important milestone in Vostok history. The first deep drilling uh, began, not, not, not to reach the lake yet, you know. They still did not know about the lake uh, at that time. So I could tell many stories about the, these guys, uh, well, but no time for this, unfortunately. But it was, I hope somebody will, read, will uh, write this book uh, some, sometime in, in the future. So why people drilling really ice in, in Antarctica, actually, and in Greenland and in other, other polar uh, and mountain glaciers? Well, it was a long time ago that people realized that the uh, glaciers are really very good climatic archives. Because, for example, at Vostok, even in summer, temperature is minus 30, so is, there is no melting at all. And all the precipitation are kept there and accumulated for 1,100 years. And if you dig a pit, for example, uh, you may uh, recover this fossil precipitation, as we can say. And if you study the uh, properties of these layers, like chemical content and whatever, you, you may study what was climate or weather uh, during the formation of this precipitation in, in the remote past. Uh, OK, by shovel, you can make pits maybe 10 meters or so, not more if you want to go deeper. and. Uh, 
mm, uh, more far away in time, then you need to apply some techniques like drilling, for example. Well, the principle is simple. You just have a cylinder or metal tube with the knives on the, uh, on the bottom and it's rotating and cutting uh, ice and then you get this uh, cylinder of ice, which is called ice core. Actually. And then you make a huge piles of these ice cores, which is called core storage and it's like really a you know, frozen climate archive, climatic archive. And then you, uh, well, study the properties of this ice. This black olives here is uh, actually uh, air bubbles. And they are preserved there in the ice since the many, many uh, years ago. So we just have samples of ancient atmosphere. We can study the gas content of it, for example. Then we can study the isotopic content of, uh, of ice and it gives us the temperature and we can study impurities and chemical content and size of uh, ice crystals and whatever. And after all, it appears that ice cores are maybe the best paleoclimatic archive comparing to all other sources of information like lake sediments and marine sediments and tree rings and whatever. So ice cores produce the, uh, uh, well, the biggest quantity of data and maybe with the uh, better quality, actually. And this is a very short overview of what was uh, produced from Ostok ice core. So we have a full climate history over the uh, roughly half million year from this ice core. We have one, two, three, four full climatic cycle, uh, cycle, cycles. So now we live in uh, our own period, Holocene. And it was a uh, cold period 30,000 years ago. And uh, uh, previous interglacial, previous warm period, even uh, 120,000 years ago, and so on and so on. And uh, also very important is that the, uh, for the first time from Vostok Ice Core, we received the uh, record of uh, greenhouse gases in uh, the atmosphere of our planet. And now we know for sure that the amount of gases that which we have now in atmosphere is unprecedented. It was not like this uh, for millions of years before, you know, it's not natural. And for the first time, it was shown that there is a very tight correlation between temperature and greenhouse gases in atmosphere and so on. So there, there have been actually many discoveries made in, based on this ice core. And in 1999, uh, French glaciologist Jean-Robert Petit published this famous paper, uh, which was since then uh, cited many thousand times. It's one of the most cited paper in uh, geographical sci sciences, by the way. So I just want to tell you that Vostok was quite famous name even before this uh, lake story, you know, it was. This story is very long and, uh, and uh, it, it already saw many successes in, in its life. And then, then in 1998, uh, something happened with ice, with ice core. It, its properties uh, changed drastically. So isotopic signal disappeared and uh, gas content uh, is dropped to zero and so on and so on. So the properties of the size was totally different. And the reason was found uh, uh, very quickly. So people just realized that we entered to the lake ice. So the ice which formed from the lake water, from the lake beneath, the, uh, beneath uh, our borehole. Because at Lake Vostok we have two areas, melting in the northern part and freezing in the southern part of, of the lake. And this is how I'm uh, slowly switching into the, uh, my main subject about Lake Vostok. And first question is like this, can melt water exist under deeply frozen Antarctic glacier? 50,000 years ago, this question sounds uh, a bit strange. Of course, no, because there is a minus 60 uh, on the top of the glacier. So how it could be melt on the bottom? But well, answer is simple. There is a geothermal flux because our earth is warm. Uh, inside, so when you go deeper to the ground, temperature increases, and the same, just the same, is going on in glaciers. And if you, if your glacier is thick enough, then at some, uh, at certain depths, it will melt, simply melt. It will reach a melting point. And one of the first guys who de described this uh, theoretically, uh, it was uh, Igor Zotikov. Uh, it, he was a very interesting person, by the way. He was a writer and painter and so on. And he was really good in telling stories, by the way. He was exceptionally good. 
And he published this picture in uh, 1961, and he showed the areas of melting in uh, under Antarctic uh, continent, continent. So he was like one of the first who theoretically uh, proved that the lakes mu must exist below Antarctica. And it was uh, another funny story related to him. In 1968, he was defending his thesis about all this, you know, melting in, in Antarctica. And, uh, well, the professors did not believe to him. They said, no, it's not possible. And then, he, again, he was very lucky because just uh, one day or two days before his uh, presentation, <coughs> his defense, something happened in Antarctica. At American Bird Station, the deep drill went to the bottom of the, of the glacier. So it happened 29 of January 1968. And the water came to the borehole, though uh, Radar Saudin didn't show any water layer beneath the glacier. But water came, like, I don't know, to 40 meters to the borehole, and it was totally unexpected for them, and they even lost their drill. It was a kind of catastrophe, and, and so on. And they sent a telegram to, to this guy, Igor Zotikov, and he showed this on his, <laughs> on his defense, <laughs> and uh, it was a success. So he became a doctor of science, so something like this. <laughs> okay, and uh, I will tell you a few more milestones of this uh, uh, story of, of discovering Lake Vostok. Next important person to, to be mentioned is Andrei Kapitsa. He was, uh, in the 50s, he was a young guy and he participated in second Antarctic expedition and he made seismic soundings in Antarctic interior. And he received some, you know, double reflections from the bottom, and he interpreted it as a, as a mm, sediment, uh, sedimentary layer, but actually it was water layer as we know now. But he misinterpreted it and, and remembered about these results like 50 years after, after that. <laughs> and in '96 he published a paper in Nature about the discovery of Lake Vostok. So he is considered as the person who actually discovered it more or less like this. And uh, well, in the 90s, uh, they were uh, rather serving uh, performed by uh, uh, British people. So they used the airplane with a radar and they uh, obtained uh, reflections typical for water, you know, and also in the area of, of uh, where Lake Vostok is. But also they did not realize that there is a one single huge lake, a huge lake. They thought it's uh, like water lenses uh, spread it all, all, all around uh, Antarctic. And finally, 1993, so after the development of satellite era and satellite altimetry, uh, people constructed precise map of elevation uh, for the whole Antarctic. And th then they saw these very strange, huge flat areas. So actually the Antarctic surface looked like this. It's, uh, you know, it's ripped like uh, the sea floor, for example very similar to that, but in some places they could observe very flat areas, very unusual and not too typical. And they, they realized that in these places the ice just floating on water. This is why it's so flat. And this, is the, this year is actually the year when everybody said, yes, there are huge lakes uh, underneath the Antarctic uh, ice sheet. And this guy Ridley, he actually gave the name to Vostok Lake, just because there is a Vostok station over there. So simple. Well, just some pictures uh, how this lake looked like. It's one of the biggest in th on, on Earth. It's the uh, five uh, largest lake in the world if you uh, consider the water volume. It's 6,000 uh, cubic kilometers, very huge. The area is like 15,000 square kilometers. <coughs> it's, it's very similar to Lake Ladoga, for example, the uh, biggest uh, European lake you know, northwest of Russia. Uh, and quite deep, like uh, like 1,200 meters is the deepest, probably, yeah. It's not the only one, by the way. There are many, many uh, lakes, uh, uh, small lakes. Uh, they are shown by triangles here and even uh, subglacial rivers. At least people believe that it is exist. And uh, it's now a very popular subject to study because uh, uh, people r realize that uh, these hydrological system beneath Antarctica is very important for uh, ice dynamics, for example. If you do not take in, it into account, then you may think that your 
I see it as much more stable than, than, it, than it, it, it is actually. So I mean that it is more unstable in reality. And we must take into account when we uh, focused fu future uh, disintegration of ice sheets, for example, or stuff like this. And uh, yeah, this is how this uh, subglacial river may look like. This is a real picture of uh, one subglacial tunnel somewhere on the edge of, of Antarctica, close to Novolazarevskaya station. And if we remove ice sheet, maybe the uh, bedrock will look like this. Uh, this is an area of dry valleys close to McMurdo, American McMurdo station. And uh, people believe it was a huge water flows some million, million years ago here. And if we remove the ice, maybe the rest of Antarctica will look more or less uh, this way. <coughs> So why Lake, Lake, why Lake Vostok is the most interesting for us? First of all, it's the biggest, okay? <coughs> but it's not the only reason, you know? Yeah. Uh, we think that it is quite uh, old lake. It, it could exist for a million years uh, already, and it could be separated from the rest of the planet for the million of years, and then unusual forms of life could develop there, for example. That's, that's possible, why not? And uh, so it is considered as an analog of uh, Earth analog of extraterrestrial subglacial oceans, which exist, for example, at the Europa planet. It's a satellite of Jupiter. Then it is located very well in terms of logistics, because yeah, we have station there. We have station, and we have a logi logistic uh, transport every year, twice a year, at, uh, along this route. So we may explore the lake easily, you know, more or less easily. Uh, and after all, we have a deep drilling project here, which was started much before the lake was uh, discovered. But now we, it is also used as an access hole to the lake, right? And we have uh, more than 200 meters of accreted lake ice, so we can study lake before entering it. So we already know a lot about it uh, before penetration to the lake. Well, I just want to say that sometimes the drilling is not very easy as you can think, uh, for example, uh, there are many, there are many accidents happened during this drilling history. And it's a good time to uh, tell you the secret of these strange names. So it's uh, the bowhole now is called 5G2, the name of deep bowhole at, at Vostok. Why 5G2? G, it means глубокий, uh, it means deep in Russian, okay? Uh, five, it's the number of this bowhole. It's bowhole number five, deep bowhole number five. The previous four were lost during accidents. So the drills were lost and, and uh, you know, taken by ice, uh, by squeezing ice and so on. And even for this uh, fifth ball hole, there is a, I forgot the English name for this. Uh, well, it's a already second deviation of the main, of the main ball hole, you know, because for example, in 2007, Again, the drill war was lost at this depth, and we study, studied, uh, started a new borehole, but not from the top, from the depth of like 3,600 meters. So there is a technique which allows you to make a new borehole, not from the top, but you, it's possible to make a, a deviation from the, from the main borehole somehow. Well, what, what do we know about the lake already? Uh, what did, you, did we know before penetration? Well, not that many things, by the way. So we know the morphology of the lake, of course, the size, volume, and so on. We know that there is a melting of ice in the northern part of the lake and a freezing of ice uh, in the uh, southern part of the lake. And what happened then? All the impurities and gases which uh, goes to the lake in northern part uh, they uh, just arrive from, from ice. They remain in the lake because forming ice, it's completely pure. Because slowly frozen ice, you know, it pushes away all the impurities and gases. And they accumulate in the lake. And this is why there is a, we support there is a very high concentration of gases and of oxygen in the lake. Uh, there is a hydrothermal activity. There are hot springs at Wostok beneath the lake. Somehow we, we, can, uh, we can know about this. Well, there is not perfect mixing of this melt water when it goes to the freezing, uh, freezing area. And this is why maybe there are some ecological niches for the microbiota to be hided from this uh, 
high oxygen level because oxygen is a poison for, for microbes. And there is an ultra oligotrophic environment in the lake. There is nothing to eat there actually. And uh, expected microorganism which can live there is uh, oxygenophilic. So they like, must like oxygen. And it is not known on our planet still. It's just a fantasy of, of microbiologists. And hemautotrophs, you understand what it means? So they feed uh, themselves, but without life, using some chemical reactions and so on. Okay, and now a few words about the last uh, season at Vostok, which uh, started, well, drilling started 2nd of January, and the uh, end of the season was 5th of February 2012. Ah, yeah, sorry, I just make some, uh, you know, uh, Reminder for myself that I, I now I, I need to, to to show you some pictures. <laughs> it was an unusual season, I should tell you. Maybe the best in my uh, well in my life. In my for my experience, it was the best one. And the miracles began already in the very in the first days of the season. We observed a bird there, and you know, I was not alone who observed it. I, I was not drunk at the time, so I have a <laughs> yeah. Five or six people cannot go crazy, you know, at the same time. So we observed a bird, and then, after all, I asked actually people who study the birds. They say yes, it's possible that they may fly into the interior of Antarctica for unknown reason. Actually, they may be just, you know, like spies or something like this. They want for they they uh, searching for new uh, places where they can feed themselves and so on. So they they fly any direction, and of course they die then and. It's a very pity story, but, but I took good pictures after, <laughs> after all. But the resolution of the pictures are not, 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 not good enough, unfortunately. But it was a clear sign that something must happen this season. This is our main borehole, 5G. Uh, this, this is how it looked like in midnight, because there is a polar day, of course, you understand. You understand why we need to use this uh, uh, you know, drilling mast, because uh, it's, it's like a home for the drill. When we go, it, uh, pull it up, so it occupies all this place in, in this uh, borehole. So we may uh, then, uh, you know, dismantle it and, and so on. And an easy way to do. This is, uh, well, one of the working moments uh, before the drilling, because we cannot just go there and start drilling, no. We need to study first the conditions in the borehole because it's, it's, it's living, you know. It, it may change its diameter, and so on, because uh, we, we use a drilling fluid to put to the borehole. If you do not do it, then it will be squeezed very fast, and it will, it will close in, in uh, maybe a few weeks or months, you know. So we use a liquid uh, with a density close to density of ice, and which cannot be freezed at the temperature of minus 60. So it's a mixture of kerosene and freon, actually. And so before drilling, we check the density of this fluid, and if it's too uh, light, then we put more freon and so on. It's a, and it takes uh, from two weeks to one month, this preparational work before drilling. This is one of the working moments. Pe people take samples of this fluid to measure density then. Well, uh, in the uh, last days of December 2000, 2011, the drilling began, but first runs, they were empty. You know, there were no uh, no high score, for some reasons we could not break it and pull it up. And he, the Professor Vasilyev, main driller, he looked quite disappointed, you know, he looked into the drill, ah, empty again. And, and this is why our, our New York party was quite sad, you know, <laughs> yeah. even despite some nice uh, drinks over there. So, yeah, people were disappointed, but not all of them. <laughs> Some people just didn't care <laughs> at all. <laughs> and okay, f uh, finally, 2nd of January, the, the first ice core. You see it's quite long because it was drilled during several runs. And so you drill like three times and finally you get it. So this is why it's so long. It, it was obtained during at least three runs as far as I remember it. You can see that, for example, diameter here and here it's different. So this was maybe one run and this was another run and so on. And this is a main glaciologist chief glaciologist uh, Vladimir Lipinkov. He is the chief of all this uh, project of exploring uh, Lake Vostok and, and uh, deep drilling at Vostok. Okay. Then, uh, closer to the end of the season, uh, it was 
two or three meters to the lake, as we know now, uh, the ice core began look uh, very strange. You maybe can see this very strange features there, you know, this uh, like it was uh, water going down uh, along the, the ice core. So this is the top of ice core and this is the bottom. So the water was, you know, flowing down and freezing. You can see this character very characteristic feature and here again. And this is how ice core must look like usually. It's completely, you know, it's beautiful. It's very uh, smooth. Uh, only small particles of, of these uh, ice chips which formed during drilling, but otherwise it's uh, completely smooth, you know. It look wet here, but it's not wet, it's kerosene, which, which is uh, evaporating slowly. And la last day ice core looked like this. So we felt that water is very close, very close. Then 5th of February, the last hours of our season, the, we had a VIP visitors to Vostok Station. This is a Minister of Natural Resources of, uh, of Russia, so our big boss, you know. And this is uh, uh, the head of Russian Hydrometeorological Service. Also our big boss, but a bit low level. <laughs> okay. So they came just to, to check what is going on there, actually, because no, nobody, nobody of them were, was in Antarctica before. They just were wondering what's going on, actually. And then they gave some, uh, you know, medals and, uh, uh, to, to some people, and which is the most important, they gave us some nice drinks, like uh, old cognac, for example. <coughs> this was much more, you know, much, much better, at least for me. Well, and at that time, we already, know, we, uh, already knew that lake must be very close because in the, in the beginning of the season, we calculated a graph like this, a graph of probability of penetration to the lake as a function of depth, you know. And on the 5th of February, the probability was already more than 60%. So it could happen really every hour, every minute. And... Uh, uh, so these guys, they, uh, they left the station uh, uh, early evening on 5th of February and uh, we were going, you know, to close everything already and to prepare for leaving, but we just decided to make one more run, just another run, just because we had some time during the night, you know, spare time, nothing to do, of course. Yeah, it's boring to sleep, you know. And, uh, well, and then it happened. So it's... Uh, mm, the time was 23, 21, local time at Vostok. And so during drilling, the uh, characteristic of, of the parameters of drilling became suddenly very, very strange. First of all, the pressure on the uh, drill, it increased rapidly and extremely, how to say, to, uh, to huge extent. You, you cannot get such a pressure on, on the drill if you just put it on, on the ice, for example. And during drilling, Pressure on the drill, it never can be like this, you know, it's more or less close to zero. And the uh, power on aging, it dropped because it looked like it's nothing to drill anymore, you know. And it took, it took our drillers just two seconds to realize what's going on and to start pulling up the, the drill. They are really good, you know. No one of them had uh, experience of penetrating two lakes. How do they know this? But they, it took them two seconds. They are, they are good guys, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they are really good. Well, and two hours uh, after that, the... Oh, no, sorry. Five seconds after that, this is what was going on in the bowhole. So the kerosene went up from the bowhole because of the pressure of lake water, you know, from beneath. So what was going on, actually? So the pressure of this liquid fl fluid was two, three or four atmospheres bars less than pressure of water in the, in the lake. And this is why at the moment of penetration, so kerosene did not go to the lake. No, instead of this, water went to the borehole and pushed this drill and so on, and pushed this uh, liquid fluid up. And the level of, was so high that it even you know, went off the borehole into the, our drilling shelter. We tried to pump it, and we pumped uh, like two barrels, but the, the most, mostly it, it went on the floor, like one cubic meter maybe, or maybe more. We don't know. It's just a very rough estimation. And it, uh, uh, it lasted like five minutes, this uh, 
this fontaine was functioning like yeah, five minutes more or less. Then uh, the fluid went down again. And then two hours later, the, we pull out the drill and it looked like this. It was all, uh, you know, uh, like it was like a snowball. So it was uh, frozen water all around. So it's a really good sign that it was uh, washed in, in the lake water. Totally, you know. So it looked like this. We never, no, no, no one of us have seen this before, actually, I should tell you. And there were some ice particles uh, uh, which uh, fall down from, from the drill, so people had to use a, a kind of protection. And then this is how the drill uh, had to look like, so uh, this huge, <coughs> uh, hu huge uh, a uh, piece of ice was frozen on, on the bottom of the drill and immediately we took some samples, of course, for microbiology, for isotopes and so on. We packed and sent them to St. Petersburg. It's still somewhere in the ship in, in Antarctica. It will arrive on May, so don't ask me about lake, what we found. We, we didn't found uh, yet anything, so it, it's, still, it's still coming there, the, these samples. And then to uh, dis uh, dismantle the drill. Uh, it, it, it was not possible. It was not possible to do it in usual way. So people had to warm it to remove this ice, and only then we could, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> break the drill apart. And uh, yeah, this is how the uh, drill head looked like after we uh, removed this uh, ice piece. And to extract the last ice core, also we needed to warm the, uh, this, uh, this tube. And this is the last, really the last one, the last ice core of 5G2 borehole is uh, going out from, from the drill. This is how it looked like uh, uh, closer. So you see that uh, the top and the bottom are uh, uh, <coughs> The, the ice core kept uh, alive, but the, all the middle is crashed totally. And so the drill said it's a typical uh, picture when you, for example, if you drop ice core, it will be crushed in the middle. I don't know why, but it, it, somehow the mechanics works like, like this. So this picture also demonstrates that uh, it was a huge, uh, it was really heated by, uh, by lake water in the moment of pe penetration. Well, this is the last, uh, ice cores uh, which were put into the uh, ice core storage and also it's a coincidence we just uh, we had just uh, the same amount of these you know tubes for uh, for the ice cores as ice cores themselves themselves so it was exactly the same number it, uh, well one of the mysteries of this uh, season and by the way uh, after the this uh, the uh, last run, the drilling run, the you know this logbook of, of drills. It also was the last page, so <laughs> and it was uh, you know mysteries like this uh, all around this season. Yeah. It was very strange, and you know we have this uh, special wall in the drill uh, shelter when we write down the uh, most important events, and I think that will be the last uh, signature on this wall. So, Ozero. You understand, maybe, yeah? Yeah, Ozer. Ozer. yeah, and the date, that's all. Okay, and uh, maybe I have, what, a, what about time? Okay, I have uh, a couple more sli slides, if you allow me to do it. Okay, so this is what, yeah, this is what happened during the penetration. So the bohol went to the lake and lake water it went up now it's freezing it, it freezed al uh, already i think and then next year we will go there and drill again and then this is how we will study the lake water we will study it in frozen state we will not go to the lake at least next season but after afterwards uh, after maybe two or three years we want to continue this story and here, slide showing you that it's not the only one lake which will be studied in, uh, in uh, next years. There is a project at Lake Elsort, for example. Next year, they will be drill <coughs> drilling to this lake, but 
it will be very fast uh, dr drill with uh, uh, hot water, you know, the, uh, without ice core. And it will take them just maybe two weeks. It's really fast and it just consumes a lot of energy. Quite simple uh, way to drill, by the way. But if you d want to get ice core, then you should not, you should not use this, uh, this way. And also it will be, I think instead of uh, water sample, uh, they will get a kind of soup of bacteria or something like this, because it will be uh, bouillon of, of these microbes. So I don't know what they want to, to, to study. Then. And the uh, next stage of uh, exploding Lake Vostok, we call it second penetration. It will happen in, I don't know in how many years, but we want to put some probes into the lake to measure some properties and to, to, make, to, to take samples. And at, at Lake Elsort, they will use uh, something like this. It will be some uh, robots flying around and collecting, uh, collecting the samples. Well, and then I think uh, that's all. And I just took uh, three minutes more from you <laughs> than, than expected. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting talk. And I'm sure you have uh, many questions. That is, the audience has many questions. Very nice graphs from Vostok. But there is something I should know. What is with the time delay between some other things, SCO2, as CH4, temperature, and so on? Because on these slides, you don't see anything. Ah, yeah. You see only it's contempor contemporaneous, but it's not. Yeah, now yeah. the delays are very interesting. Thank you for this question, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed, uh, when we look, the whole, look at the whole graph like this, when we have all these 400,000 years, it appears like uh, it's all simultaneous, temperature and uh, uh, greenhouse gases, you know, changing. Where is this graph? This one? Right, okay. Uh, but actually, there is a, it's not simultaneous exactly. But the problem is uh, the dating of the ice, you know, and uh, there is a quite a big error, like 3,000 years, even now. Yeah, for such a time scale, it's not a uh, big error, but still it exists. And the second problem is that the uh, age of gas in the ice is not equal to the age of the ice, of the surrounding ice, because the pores uh, you know, snow pores, they are closed at certain depth, like 100 meters uh, below the surface. And the age of the ice at these depths is like 2,000 years, okay? And the age of uh, the gas is zero. So there is a shift uh, in, uh, of age between gas and uh, ice, and this is a second problem. But still we believe that, uh, okay, first temperatures start ar uh, rising, then uh, uh, greenhouse gases follow this uh, uh, rising, and then they cause the further rising of temperature. So it's a complicated process. First, temperature starts to increase, then greenhouse gases. And then greenhouse gases cause the further increase of temperature. The mechanism is, we believe it's something like this. Do you know how are the delays? No. <laughs> how, uh, the, the, ah, the time lag? Oh, it's just, uh, it's, it's like one, two thousand years, uh, another of one, two thousand years, the delay between uh, greenhouse gas and temperature. And maybe ocean play a role in, in this uh, uh, time lag, probably. How do you sea level? Ah, sea level? Ah, okay, so, uh, well, ice sheet thickness data is, uh, <coughs> they are uh, extracted from the ice core itself because uh, you may, uh, you know, may, you may precisely uh, measure the pressure of gas in the ice. And the pressure depends on altitude. So you just may obtain the altitude of ice sheet and then you may recalculate it into the volume somehow. <laughs> and yeah, and the sea level is just uh, from marine sediments, of course. It's a uh, very <coughs> well-known curves from, from uh, stack curve from marine, uh, marine sediments. And they, so it's two independent curves, but they correspond to each other. When we have uh, increased sea level, we have less uh, volume of ice sheet and so on. 
as, as, as must, must be expected. How is this connected with atmospheric dust? Well, uh, uh, so during warm periods, dust, uh, the amount of dust is quite low. Like now it's a relatively low amount of dust in atmosphere, but in ice ages it was like 20, 30 times more, impurity, uh, more dust particles in atmosphere because uh, it was the climate were more like desert on, on the planet and the area of deserts were uh, bigger than now and the also ice, uh, the uh, area of, of land was bigger than now yeah because the ocean was low and also the transportation from uh, tropics to polar areas were stronger because of stronger uh, meridional gradient and this caused the increase of dust during ice age uh, may I ask if, if you made some analysis on deuterium uh, presence in the... You have samples of water, this, and maybe pH and such things. You are talking about lake water now? No? Yeah, lake water. Lake water. No, as I said, no analysis uh, were made. We don't have such, uh, you know, uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, at the station. So we are bringing samples now to our laboratory to San, San Petersburg. I've, I made the first test actually, I tried this water. <laughs> but it smelled too much like kerosene. So I <laughs> even, yeah, I even can, cannot recognize if it's salty or if, if it's fresh. More, more, I think it's fresh, but I'm not sure. <laughs> what is the temperature of the water, or lake water? Is it close to four? Or? Uh, temperature of the water uh, at the uh, boundary uh, between glacier and, and lake, it's, uh, it's melting point, of course. It's minus three degrees. It's not zero, it's minus three, right? And w if you go to the bottom of the lake, it, mi ma it might be increasing because if there, is, there are hot springs there, then it must uh, increase somehow. Maybe two plus 40, 60, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know exactly about this yet. Do we have more questions? What happens to the drilling shaft between the seasons? Ah. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, somehow conserved. And, uh, but now there are two people there, two drillers. They will not, they will not do anything in the, in the borehole, maybe some you know, ge geophysical measurements. They will not be drilling. But they are, they are wintering there just to keep an eye on this, all, this, all this stuff and so on. So it just preserves the world yeah. we live in. Yes, yeah. All these years. <coughs> yeah, exactly. There's another question about the legs. Because I was told in Greenland, was at first the dust and then the yeah. temperature? Well, Greenland is uh, another story, of course, because it's much smaller than Antarctica. And uh, uh, Antarctica it really affects the climate on the whole planet. And as for Greenland, you know, it may be other mechanism because it's small and it may be influenced by other, other uh, parameters, you know, climatic parameters somewhere else yeah, on the Earth. Well, actually, I cannot answer your question uh, properly. I don't know the, the good answer for this. Up to now, this is the, the picture we are looking at, at is the most spectacular one of the, the whole drilling in Vostok. Do you expect that it will be possible from the water inside the lake to get so, imp so important results as these are here? These have explained a lot of things, these graphs here, as regards the pale paleoclimatology. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance, this is more or less guessing, is there, there a chance that also in the lakes there are such big stories as, as these curves here? Well, I think no, actually. We, probably we, if we will study the lake sediments in future, then there will be also climatic curves, but it's just uh, dreams now. But uh, uh, I think that the lake uh, itself, it does not feel the changes, the changes on the surface of the... Uh, of the glacier because even th these uh, huge climatic waves you know they it cannot go as deep as to the lake uh, it may feel the thickness of the uh, ice above for example but it does not affect lake very much so i think no the, as, as for this paleoclimatic story i think lake will not give us new 
data. It, it's another story, of course. Do we have more questions? Which seismic method did you use for uh, discovering the lake? Uh, which seismic method? Yes. Was it uh, reflection seismic VSD or something else? Uh, reflection, yeah. So they uh, make a big, uh, like big bang, and then they listen to the echo and uh, measure the time delay of, of, the, of the echo. There was, uh, on your sketch of, of drilling holes when they bifurcated, uh -huh. there was also some, some layer of what it said sediment or something. Uh -huh. So it seems that the, the certain depth yeah. uh, <coughs> the drilling out encountered some, some yeah, layer with mirroring inclusions, you said, yeah. You mean this one? Yes. What was that? Uh, that's an uh, interesting uh, story, yeah. It's, uh, well, uh, in the lake, uh, lake ice is uh, divided into big parts. Lake ice one, just like this we call it. Lake ice one, it's with mineral inclusions, and lake ice two, without inclusions, completely pure. And we believe that lake ice one, uh, it's on the upper part of the lake ice thickness. It was formed uh, in the, uh, on close to the coast of the lake. When where glacier was scratching the you know the bedrock and so on, and Lake Ice too completely pure. It was formed uh, over the deep part of the lake, closer to Vostok uh, Station. And there is one uh, layer which is extremely rich in uh, mineral inclusions. And you, if I don't know the picture with me, but if you look at it, uh, you just see this layer of, of many many particles, and some of them are quite big, like one centimeter in diameter, for example, huge ones. Yeah. So, and we use this layer, you know, to adjust to, to, to ice cores, 5G1 and 5G2. This is why we started this deviation from uh, quite, you know, quite above. Because we have this layer of minerals uh, in the 5G1 and 5G2, so we may adjust the depth then. Thank you. What kind of analysis are you planning to do with biological samples? Uh, well, all kind of possible things, uh, I, I guess, because I, I do, I, I'm not doing it personally, of course. We just send these samples to our colleagues from St. Petersburg uh, Institute of Nuclear Physics. There is a Sergei Bulat, the name of this microbiologist, and he uses DNA analysis somehow to uh, describe the microbiological content. Also, we uh, collaborate with the Institute of Microbiology in Moscow. They use classical method. They observe in... Uh, this in microscopes, and they try to cultivate Any these results microbes. Yet? Well, for the lake ice, they just dis discovered that it's completely pure. There is uh, less than one cell per one millimeter of, of ice. It's just nothing, it's zero, you know. And up to now, they could find only one uh, microbe that we believe was existing in the, in the lake bottom. It's a, a kind of hydrothermal bacteria. Bacteria living in hot springs. This is why it's one of the reasons uh, uh, why we think that there are hot springs there. Not the only, no, not the only uh, reason. We have um, time for one last question, if there is one. Are you going back to Antarctica? <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, okay. in November, I hope. Yeah. Let's thank Dr. Rikaikin again.